Good morning, Mountainside. Thank you for being uh, with us this morning. This is our third uh, Sunday morning worship streaming. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning. If you're visiting, we especially want you to know how thankful we are for you having gone to our website or however you've done it, but you're with us this morning, and thank you. And We don't take that lightly. In fact, we can't wait for the moment that uh, when this ordeal is over that perhaps you'll make the decision to come and see us in person. We would love to meet you. We would love for you to meet, meet us and worship with us. And, uh, but once again, thank you for being here this morning. And without any further delay, let us begin our worship this morning. Thank you. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it is with you. And pray that we may be delivered from the wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful, and He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love in Christ's perseverance. I sing praises to your name, O Lord. Praises to your name, O Lord. For your name is great and greatly to be praised. Sing praises to your name, O oh Lord. Praises to your name, O oh Lord. For your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name. Jesus reaching to all. 
wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, perfect like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression, sing it greater far than all my sin and shame, you guys. I look forward to being together again, and I just ask that you pray with me right now.
The fathers come before you right now. I just ask that that we're united as a country, that we're united as a congregation, and that we we have strength in our prayer, Father. And uh, acknowledging right now, before I ask you for anything, that we have a lot to be thankful for. And more than anything, I thank you for your grace and your gift of salvation in your Son. And Father, for those of us that um, are able to continue to work and that we have an uh, income right now, we, we're grateful. Father, help us to be mindful of those that, are, that don't. Father, I lift up those that, that are uh, they're raising families and, and they're concerned about their income and they don't have what they need right now. And uh, Father, I just ask you to give them peace. Father, may we reflect on what you've given us and be willing to do what we need to do for, e for each other. May we be good, good stewards. Uh, may we be um, generous and help everyone right now that needs help, whether it be emotionally or financially. Father, I lift up the doctors, nurses, technicians, emergency medical technicians, all of the people that are on the front line that are trying to save lives and doing so without the supplies that they need. Father, I ask that, that things work out. I know this next two weeks is going to be a very, very tough time on our country. But for those that are on the front lines, I just ask that you protect them. Protect them from the virus and uh, help their bodies stay strong. Father, um, I lift up those that are in the industries that are just so necessary for us right now. I think about the the truck drivers, the men and women that are just driving up and down the road, keeping our grocery stores supplied and, and all the workers that that involves. I just ask that they stay healthy and um, that we get through this as soon as possible. Father, I, I lift up... Uh, Roman and Johanna. I think about the country they're in and the challenges that they have and her uh, carrying a child inside her right now and I just ask that uh, you keep her safe from this virus, that you protect that child in her and in any, any of our moms that are expecting. I just ask for that extra protection right now. Father, I, I think about Odeon in Nigeria and, and all our Christian brothers there and I just ask that you help that country through this time Think about Philip and Bolivar in Haiti and Francio at the orphanage and, and just uh, help them through these times and uh, lift up their government and ask that they will treat that country better. Father, I think about Wayne and Mary in North Dakota and Ed and Vicki Bass and Wayne and, let's see, and uh, Garrett and Jesse. Ask that you bless their efforts and help them in their endeavors right now, help them to be what they need to be uh, to their ministries. Father, I, I thank you for loving us. I look forward to a time where we spend eternity with you and there's no more pain, there's no more sickness, there's no more anger. Father, I lift up our president and his staff. I lift up uh, our governors and, and their staff, their cabinet members, our state legislator our mayor and the city council people and just uh, help them make these tough decisions. And more than anything, I just ask that as a country and as a church body that we will learn things from this and that we'll be more devoted to you than we ever have been. That we'll have an appreciation for our fellowship that we've never had before. That will make a greater impact for you than we otherwise would have. This could be a time of revival for this country. Father, may we learn the lessons that you'd have us to so that we may serve you well for whatever, day, whatever number of days you give us. Father, I ask these things in your Son's name. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. <clears throat> and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. 
It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails. But when there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. time of our worship where we're going to partake in the Lord's Supper and it's a time that we spend a little bit of our mental focus on just reflecting and so this morning I'd like to give you three uh, things to reflect upon. Number one, I think we need to take a moment to maybe look in the rearview mirror so to speak and reflect upon who we were before the sacrifice of Christ. Uh, Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So take a moment to reflect upon who we were before the sacrifice of Christ and before His body was hung on a cross. Then take a look within 
Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28 says, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread, the bread and drink of the cup. Take a second to reflect on where you're at, where you're at spiritually, how you're feeling, um, what battles you might be facing, and how often you're taking those to the Lord in prayer. And then lastly, uh, let's take a look ahead. Maybe the most exciting part and the most uh, encouraging part of this communion is to reflect upon the coming of Christ. At Revelation chapter 9, verses 6 through 7 says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of a rushing water, and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. This reason, this is reason to rejoice. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. At this time, let's pray for the bread. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord. Lord, as we reflect upon different things at this time in our service, Lord, we consider um, who we were before, um, before the sacrifice of your Son, Lord, and we were uh, sinful people in need of a Savior. And Lord, you provided that through your Son, Jesus Christ. Um, Lord, I'm so thankful for Jesus, and I'm so thankful for that sacrifice, Lord. And as I reflect upon the coming, uh, what is to come, Lord, and, and that is eternal life uh, with you and with your Son, Lord, it's so exciting, and I can't even imagine what heaven's going to be like. But Lord, I, I'm so thankful. And so as we partake of this bread, Lord, I pray that we take it uh, as we reflect upon and we consider the sacrifice that your Son made. Lord, we thank you so much. And Jesus, we thank you so much for the sacrifice you made. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and continue in prayer for the cup. Heavenly Father, we come to you again thankful for the life-giving blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord. Lord, we know that this, this blood does provide us not only with um, life, but life eternal. And we're so thankful for that, Lord. So I pray as we, uh, again, as we reflect upon uh, what that means and what uh, life forever with you means, Lord. I pray that we dream big and we use our imagination to understand and consider what heaven really looks like, Lord. We thank you so much for the sacrifice of your son, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Since the love of God is shared, priceless blessings on my head, I have made, I have made, made it my own. In my own. I will hide it in my heart that it never may depart. It shall rule, it shall rule there alone.
Well, good morning, Mountainside. I'm so glad that you're with us here this morning. And it, isn't it hard to believe that we are already 13 days into, I sadly uh, say, our new norm. And I can't wait until we return back to our old normal again. But until that time, we'll continue using technology and making the best of this particular circumstance. I'm so proud of Mountainside. I keep hearing story after story of how you're looking out for one another, and I pray that you continue to do so. What a way to be a blessing uh, to others, and at the same time, God will bless you in having done so. Now, if you are one of those who's in that category, you are more vulnerable if you were to contract this virus. And, and you need some things. I want you to know I've had so many that have said they want to help. They want to help in any way possible, and they will respect your rules on social distancing uh, in any way that you ask. But you know what? Your responsibility is, is you have to ask. Let us know what that need is. Another way that many of you have been looking out for one another is simply by using your phones. And thank you. Continue doing so. Vera and I have been calling uh, lots of different members and we'll continue doing so. Maybe before it's over, I will have talked to all of you on the phone at one time or another. But it's a tremendous blessing. In fact, the conversations are awesome because it's not like the auditorium where there's distractions and interruptions. It's just pure conversation, just you and, and whoever you're talking to. So if you want to be blessed, get on the phone. Start checking on your mountainside brothers and sisters in Christ. And you know what? Another great way to witness is to uh, check on your neighbors. Check on those right around your home. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this first day of week and what it represents. Father, thank you for Jesus. And Father, thank you ahead of time for seeing us through this crisis. Father, we love you. And Father, may we live for you in every way possible, even when it's not easy, like in a crisis such as the coronavirus, Father. But thank you. Thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. You know, we live in a time when many people get up on Sunday and they do their, their normal routine, breakfast, whatever that is, and then you head off to the church building and, and you, you head to that place where on average it's probably an hour-long service. And, and it's also that place that you, you probably consider yourself to be a member of that church. And, and for churchgoers, this is quite normal. I mean, after all, uh, generally speaking, this is what you've grown up doing your entire life. I mean, after all, all good Christians are going to go to church. But now comes the difficult part, and it's, it's a tough question. Have you ever seen anything in Scripture close to the many different patterns we see in churches today? Do you find anywhere in Scripture the words that a believer went to church? And if you're wondering where I'm going with this, then try to imagine for a moment Peter and Paul having a conversation uh, about church much like we find ourselves doing quite often, actually. Paul hasn't seen Peter. Peter hasn't seen Paul in quite some time. And uh, they run into each other, and there's a little bit of small talk. And, man, it's so good to see you. And, and finally, Paul asks Peter, he says, Peter, where are you going to church now? Oh, I go to the community on the river church. Uh, it's a wonderful place. I tell you, I love their worship minister. The preacher's pretty good. And oh, they have so many conveniences for my kids. It's just such a blessing. And, and Paul responds uh, to that real excited. And he says, do you think I would be welcome there? I've been looking for a church home. Where I'm going now, it just, it just isn't meeting my needs. And then Peter gets excited and he says, oh, well, of course you'd be welcome. But I'll tell you, uh, don't don't plan on coming this Sunday because I, uh, I won't be there. My wife and I, we have to take our daughter to a tournament down in Nazareth. And, but we'll be back next Sunday. So please uh, wait. We'll go together and I'll introduce you to everyone. And Paul said, man, that, that sounds awesome. I'm going to make that a plan. And they start walking away from each other. And Paul turns around, hey, Peter, do you guys have a singles program? 
You know, it's almost comical, isn't it, to think about these two spiritual giants having this kind of conversation. But you know what? This kind of conversation is not uncommon at all in the Christian world today. Why is that? Why is that? Now, this morning, don't hear me say that all of the different things that many churches offer to their members today, that they're that they're wrong, that they're not good, because that's not the case at all. They can be a tremendous blessing. But what bothers me is how we reduced what is nothing less than a mystery. I'm talking about our God, His church, Jesus Christ, what He did for all humanity, the blessing of the Holy Spirit. And we've reduced it down to, generally speaking, this one-hour service. I can't think of a church anywhere that's not guilty of this in some way. I read an absolutely amazing story about a shepherd in a particular church. And had you known this person prior to this part of his life, you would have said that would have never happened. This person would never darken the doors of a church, much less be a church leader someday. His name is Rob. You see, Rob's early life was, was in gangs. He was a gang member and he was as involved as you could be. In fact, eventually it landed him in prison. And praise God, that's where he met and accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. And that happened while he was in solitary confinement. And he talks about how, how afraid he was at that point because he knew when he accepted Jesus as his Savior that you know that's what he needed to do. But at the same time, he feared for his life because he knew that he would have to separate himself from the gang. And in prison, that was tad amount to a death sentence. You might say that was his first real test of faith, his, will, his, his first real test of trusting his God. And praise God, we know the rest of that story and God spared his life. But even after leaving the gang, there was some things about that past life that Rob truly missed. And the biggest one was that he missed the gang for, for the tremendous love that they had for one another. I mean, they would truly die for one another. In fact, many had done just that. And the gang for, for all those years had been the only family that Rob had known. They were loyal. They were dear friends. They literally looked out for one another 24-7. And he had enjoyed this love, this camaraderie, basically since childhood. And when I read that story, and there were many more details, I can't help but think that's exactly what the church is meant to be. You know, of course, minus the drugs, the murder, and you know, all those tiny details. <laughs> But the idea of being a family is central to God's design for His church. And I share Rob's story because, sadly, if we're honest with each other, these gangs sometimes have a stronger sense of what it means to be family than what many churches do today. In fact, what little we know about gangs, can you, can you see gang life reduced to this one-hour weekly gathering? I don't think so. Can you imagine one gang member walking up to another gang member and say, Yo, yo, bro, how you doing, man? How was gang this morning? I, I would have I would have been there, but uh, and things were just kind of tough around the house this weekend. You see, that would never happen. But sadly, that's often what happens in Christian conversations. I mean, how was church? How was church? That sacred entity that God set up, that God equipped to function as a family, has far too often been reduced to this optional weekly meeting. You could say that, I don't want to say this, but you could say that it's become the norm. And what scares me is the possibility of our referring to church as family, that that simply becomes a cliche. May that never happen. Now let's get to some reality. God really does expect us to be close with people whom we are not related to, even those who, whom we would never associate with, if not for our relationship with each other in Jesus Christ. And we know what gets between us and brothers and sisters in Christ. It's all those different prejudices that we come up with ourselves. You see, it's quite natural for us to be close to our own families, but it's very unnatural for Rick to be close to someone who's not like me. And it would be the same for you. But see, in the church, in God's plan, that's exactly the point. It's not supposed to be natural. In fact, you could say it's supernatural. It's only possible on a consistent basis 
with God's help through Jesus Christ as we are in Jesus Christ. John chapter 13, verse 34 through 35. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You see, the New Testament over and over in multiple places makes it very clear that the Lord's church is to be known for its love. In fact, Jesus said that it's this love for one another that attracts the world to us, ultimately to God. And I wonder today, in, just in our own community, how many churches are literally known for their love, are known for their love? Now, I could think of several churches that are known for their excitement, their powerful uh, preaching, worship, production value. But my question is, is that the same? Is that the same? And you know that phrase in verse 35, one another. Did you know that that phrase is mentioned over a hundred times in the New Testament in one fashion or another? You see, this is an area God clearly cares about, and so should the church. And as I close this morning, as your minister, as a shepherd, uh, one of many at the Mountainside Church of Christ, I have the question, you know, when the world comes into Mountainside, do they notice a special love, a special love? And I'm not suggesting that there isn't any love at all. Of course not, because if that were the case, you know what? I wouldn't be here at Mountainside. But is it, are they seeing the kind of love that truly stands out in a way that points to something greater than ourselves. You see, this is the kind of love that sees beyond social economic barriers, sees beyond cultural prejudices, where someone lives, where they work, the color of one's skin, the clothes they wear, and the list, you know, it just goes on and on and on. In the upcoming weeks, that's what I want to look at concerning the church, this, this supernatural love, and, and what should this look like in the church? And I don't think it's a coincidence that next week is Easter, the greatest act of love that humanity has and will ever see. And church, no matter what measure of love that we have here at Mountainside, my prayer is that we are simply never satisfied. May we always seek to love more. And why? Because it's a part of the process of growing. If we want to grow, if we want to grow in Christ, if we want to be more like Christ, if we want the world to see Christ in us, they need to see this love. And this love needs to grow and to grow. 1 John 4, 7-12 Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that, we, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. Oh, those are great words from the Apostle John. I remember Jesus' words. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love. What a topic. What an important topic. Thank you for being with us this morning. And I pray that you have an extremely blessed week. Go out and love someone this week. Thank you. This little light of mine, you know that I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, you know that I'm gonna let it shine. Shine all the time, let it shine, oh yeah. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine all the time. 
Mountainside, thank you once again for tuning in. I'm so thankful that we have this way of staying connected together, even though we are separated. Just want to let you guys know a few things about our congregation before we close in prayer. Uh, Carol Fitzgerald had a, a car accident last week, and she's battling an infection in her leg. So be praying that that, that quickly subsides, uh, or at least doesn't progress and get any worse. We also want to let you know one of our ministries here, Phoebe, this last Thursday, they sent out 42 cards, and what a blessing they are to us. And so uh, reach out to them. Let them know how thankful you are for the, the work of encouragement that they're doing. I want you guys to also be ready to tune in every Tuesday and Thursday as we continue our words and messages of encouragement, just a way for us to keep connected and encouraging each other during this time. Uh, finally, I just want to let you guys uh, know as just like with Rick's lesson today, we should be calling each other, reaching out to each other. We have the technological advances to stay connected better at this time than ever before. And so use those. Be willing to, to love on each other in that way. So thank you once again. Uh, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I do thank you so much. I thank you for the moments that we have together. Uh, even though we are separated, we know that we are united in your son, Jesus Christ. And so as at this time, we just want to thank you for Jesus and everything that he's done for us to, to bring us unification, not only with each other, but with you. Father, I want to ask you to be with our congregation during this time, and it can be so difficult and a struggle to be separated, and so I just ask that you give them, uh, give them peace and comfort. Father, I want to close with, this, uh, with these words. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tell me, church, do you love Jesus? Oh, yes, we love Jesus. Are you sure you love Jesus? Yes, we sure we love Jesus. Tell us why you love Jesus. This is why we love Jesus. Because he first loved me and, and was singing all. Oh, how I love Jesus. How I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. How I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. How I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Tell me, brothers, do you love Jesus? Oh, yes, we love Jesus. Are you sure you love Jesus? Yes, we're sure we love Jesus. Tell us why you love Jesus. This is why we love Jesus. Because he first loved me. And we're singing, oh, how I love Jesus. How I love Jesus, oh. oh how I love Jesus. How I love Jesus, oh. Because he first loved me. Oh, sisters, do you love Jesus? Oh, yes, we love Jesus. Are you sure you love Jesus? Yes, we're sure we love Jesus. Tell us why you love Jesus. This is why we love Jesus. Because he first loved me. And we're singing, oh, how I love Jesus. How I love 
Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because He first loved me. And we sing and know. Oh, how I love Jesus. How I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. How I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because He first loved me.